Hi, I'm Peter Tefano, the Dean of Said Business School at the University of Oxford. Welcome to Series 2, Episode 8 of Leadership in Extraordinary Times. We started Leadership in Extraordinary Times uh, when the lockdown began in March. And over the course of these many months, we've had great conversations with a number of guests, including um, members of our Global Leadership Council and other experts, and you've heard from our great researchers as well. Well, over the next hour, our distinguished panel is gonna discuss how organizations are living up to the business roundtable statement and, and whether it's been cheap talk. Let me put this in a little bit of perspective. 50 years ago, Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago, Nobel laureate, wrote a piece that would define American business over the next half century. In, first in a New York Times article, then in a subsequent book, he wrote that the business of business is business. Railing against the excesses of managerial capitalism, managers running wild and, and using shareholders' money, he called for clarity with respect to firms, existing first and foremost to serve the interest of shareholders, a doctrine of shareholder primacy, primacy that has caught on and, and, and caught on in the midst of a wave of deregulation that has defined the order really since then. In one view, anything that maximized shareholder value at whoever's expense was okay, as long as it was legally acceptable. This included levering up firms, massive stock buybacks, disregard for the environment and more. Well, with this single-minded pursuit that was the rule of the land in the US for public corporations, in other geographies, a more balanced approach held on and leading thinkers continued to maintain the importance of the need to balance the interest of shareholders with other stakeholders, employees, customers, suppliers, community and the environment. Look, he wrote that the business of business is business. Railing against the excesses of managerial. Okay, I sounded so good. Let's hear it twice. <laughs> it's a little bit echo. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, this was all true until last summer when the American Business Roundtable issued a statement signed by 181 CEOs, which stated that the purpose of a corporation is not just to stir, sure, serve shareholders, but to create value for all stakeholders for the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. But did the statement mean anything? Did they do anything? And who is actually putting the interest of shareholders and stakeholders alongside of one another? Joining me today are three experts who chaired and sat on a panel which objectively looked at these questions. I'm here with Allison Bins. Allison's the Executive Director of Sustainability Research at Morgan Stanley. Allison is joining us here today, however, in a personal capacity as part of the task force that looked at this question. Bob Eccles is an expert in integrated reporting, a leader in sustainable strategies for companies and investors, and I'm proud to say a visiting professor of management practice at Said Business School. Hiro Mizuno is a financial executive, board member of Tesla and other firms, former investment officer, chief investment officer of Japan's $1.6 trillion global pension investment fund or GPIF, and I am proud to say an executive residence at the Said Business School and a member of our Global Leadership Council. So thank you all for joining us. As usual, we'll have a discussion of about 35 minutes and then open up the floor to questions from listeners around the globe. If you have a question for the panel, send them to us using the chat function on whichever platform you're watching and our moderators will forward those questions on to me and I will then pose them to the panel. So for those of you who haven't, looked at the intricacies of the business roundtable and, and the statement and all of that. Let's start maybe with that. Could one of you explain to our readers what the business roundtable is, what the statement actually said and how it represented a break or a continuation from the recent and more distant past? And in cold call fashion, um, since both of us spent time at Harvard Business School, uh, I'll cold call Bob Eccles to start us off. Well, thank you, Peter. That was a cold call. Um, if we could pull up the slides. Um... So really, as Peter said, I mean, was this uh, statement by the Business Roundtable, was it sincere or was it cheap talk? And, you know, Allison and Hero and I have probably different views, but if we could go to the next slide. So the Business Roundtable, for those of you not familiar with it, as Peter said, it's a fairly elite group of companies. It's mostly American. There's a few European. Um, it's kind of the blue chip companies. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is kind of like everybody. And the Business Roundtable is kind of like elite Fortune 500 type companies. And as this slide shows, in 1997, very much in keeping with Milton Friedman's philosophy, they came out with their statement on corporate governance. It was a white paper. And I've pulled from the introduction this one paragraph here. I won't read the whole paragraph. It goes on for about 30 pages. But 
it's pretty clear if you just look at what's in bold that this was all about shareholder primacy. So they're advocating very much taking the position that Milton Friedman presented in his famous letter 50 years ago to the New York Times. So it's about corporate governance and corporate governance being important to make sure that they're maximizing shareholder returns. So that was 1997. If we go to the next slide, with much fanfare on August 23rd of 2019, they came out with their statement on the purpose of a corporation. It was fairly short and it was basically advocating for what some people call stakeholder capitalism or inclusive capitalism. And they said, look, the purpose of companies, each company has a unique purpose. They didn't really define purpose a whole lot, but they said, you know, each company is responsible to, you know, the following set of stakeholders. So it's customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. The reaction to that was quite interesting. Um, the Wall Street Journal, you know, had a hissy fit at the Council of Institutional Investors, and they said, oh my gosh, shareholders are last. Well, no, they're not. They're just, that's the list. Um, if you're accountable to everybody, you're accountable to nobody. Um, the reaction in the Financial Times is quite different. The editorial policies of those two uh, newspapers continue to diverge. And this got a great deal of attention. It's like, okay, for those advocating a more long-term stakeholder approach to capitalism, they saw this as a good thing. And the Business Roundtable made quite a big deal of it because they noted how different this was from their white paper that was published in 1997. So I think it's a fair question to ask, um, are they walking the talk or is it just cheap talk? If we could do the next slide. So um, this test of corporate purpose was an initiative to try and analyze what had happened since they published their statement, you know, with the business roundtable and then companies in general. So we looked at the Fortune 500, we looked at the Eurostox 300, and there was really two parts to the study. One was a survey that was done by a company called Globescan. And then the second was a very sophisticated analysis using artificial intelligence, big data from a company called True Value Labs. What this slide shows is we had about 500 and I forget exactly now, 69 respondents or whatever. And so it was from a broad range. It was many countries It included investors it included companies, influencers, members of civil society. So that was what we got from the survey. We could do the next slide. And it was very interesting when we asked them the purpose of business, contrasting the multiple stakeholder approach with Milton Friedman, basically 92% said multiple stakeholders, stakeholder capitalism. And, and those percentages in that pie chart didn't vary very much at all really across all the different groups. And there was a further question, which I um, don't have a slide on, but it was like, do you think that this will be more or less in the future, this emphasis upon stakeholder capitalism? And there was an overwhelming percentage who said they thought that this move towards stakeholder capitalism would continue to increase over the next five years. And in fact, companies and investors thought it was going to increase even more than the other groups. So maybe we could go to the next slide. And uh, let me turn this over to uh, my friend and colleague, Allison Binns, to start talking about some of the results. These are the results that we got from the GlobeScan survey. Thanks, Bob. Uh, actually, I think these are really interesting results, frankly. Um, I don't think it's surprising that climate change, which has been obviously the focus, I think, of, of ESG investors um, and corporates, I think, over the last decade, you know, came out as um, the top priority. Um, for stakeholder management. I would say, I think one thing about this chart is inequality comes out in second place for investors and finance, um, even ahead of COVID-19, which, you know, this was this survey was done over the summer. So we were sort of still in the throes of volatility um, as we continue to be. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think that is really interesting. I think, um, you know, the, in, the financial community is seeing inequality as a long-term play that they have a part in addressing. I don't think anybody knows how to do that yet, but um, I, think that's, I think that's pretty important. Um, Peter, next slide. Um, it's the same, this was the same, similar surprise, I think, on this slide was that diversity and inclusion came out as the number one um, inter, uh, indicator group by importance um, for, for the survey. Um, health and safety and employee health were two and three, I think obviously because of COVID um, 
and then with environment and climate change. I do think, again, because this was happening right as the sort of the U.S. was being roiled by racially um, motivated protests, I think that that probably does speak to why these indicators are in the order they're in. Um, but I, I do think diversity and inclusion um, and inequality is is going to be um, something that that invest and corporates are paying more attention to long-term. Next slide. Ah. Institutional performance. As you can see, uh, independent research and academic organizations, I think maybe Peter doctored the slide, uh, came out ahead on COVID-19 um, and civil society came out ahead on, on inequality. I don't think that's necessarily um, surprising. Um, I, I was a little surprised that institutional investors were at the very bottom of this list um, <clears throat> with poor, poor performance, um, number one or number two on, on, on poor performance on COVID-19 and, and inequality. I do think this probably speaks to the ability to pivot to new issues, which I think can be um, challenging for institutional, uh, for the institutional investor space. Next slide. So here's the, the regression results of, of what, we were, what we were trying to test. And so at the top where you see COVID-19 and inequality, that is, um, um, first of all, we were using a sentiment model with True Value Labs data using essentially sort of market ESG sentiment, right? So COVID-19 and inequality at the top, those are the dependent variables that we were um, looking to to understand some of the drivers. And then on the left-hand side, you see BRT signatory, which is a dummy variable. Um, positive track record was the company in sort of the top 20% of performers before COVID-19 started. And then an early response. And this is really, um, did the company respond basically at the end of February instead of waiting until later to sort of put together a stakeholder management plan. Um, and you know, we found that being a BRT signatory um, was not a meaningful indicator of performance um, on COVID-19 or inequality issues, but having a previous track record was an indicator of performance. And also having an early response is actually um, sort of the most robust uh, coefficient. So I th think next slide, is there a next slide? There is not. So Allison, Peter, I think that's over to it. You. So yeah. thanks. Uh, you know, that was a, a whistle stop tour through uh, the test of corporate purpose initiative. So let's kind of go back a little bit more slowly and understand what it said and what it didn't say. Who actually said some of those things? Um, so the test, basically, the first part of the test, as I understand it, is what is it that various groups hope that different stakeholders or different uh, kind of economic entities would be prioritizing, right? That's the first set of slides. Um, were you surprised about the results at all? I mean, for example, climate coming in lower and diversity higher. Do you think that that's just temporary because of what was going on with the killing of George Floyd? And, um, and so any, well, any surprises there? So let's just understand expectations management first. I would so say Hiro, just on the- you want to take that oh, first? Oh yeah, Hero, go for it. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. Thank um, you know the um, that's the the very good um, you know summary of the uh, the work uh, done by this group. Well, the first of all, we started with the uh, the you know trying to find out uh, the uh, you know what the people you know the corporate and influencers and uh, you know so civil society investor they are all talking about, mm -hmm. and uh, we really trying to just uh, come up with the uh, sort of a concrete finding to challenge. Milton Friedman's uh, doctrine, uh, because the, uh, the we particularly us on this panel discussion were all the advocates of the uh, stakeholder capitalism and ESG. So, uh, but we already faced the situation like uh, you know the uh, including my uh, former colleagues or like a hardcore investment professional. They always brought up the, uh, the you know, the uh, the uh, Milton Friedman or like uh, shareholders' uh, supremacy and sometimes fiduciary duty, and uh, so we got a stuck. So we are trying to really find out whether the people's mindset changed 
and uh, we try to find out the, uh, the how they differ from one group to another. So uh, we try to get the uh, you know response from the different uh, representative of the different interest groups. So. Uh, one of the things I found is like, uh, you know, the, uh, the investors and a corporate, uh, their response to uh, climate change and COVID-19 inequality uh, brought up some surprises. But the other, you know, the, we tried to ask the other question in the second part to try to figure out, I mean, we, that's the way we try to interpret why, you know, the, uh, the, why the people are stuck there. So uh, the, I just give you one example, like an investor, uh, you know, in the first slide, they actually think like inequality is more important in terms of percentage of their possible response. And uh, I think the reason why is, uh, you know, for investor inequality, inequality is actually now regarded as the other, uh, you know, uh, immediate challenge uh, is really facing their portfolio companies or the society they are investing in. The climate, uh, you know, on the other hand, they regard that as like probably just fall beyond their investment time horizon. So uh, I think these kind of like, uh, you know, the uh, subtle difference in the statistics is just give us a back, you know, the uh, sort of the ground for discussion to interpret and uh, try to untangle the issue why people talk about that, but the, uh, we don't see much results. So uh, that's what the other first part we're trying to just, uh, you know, the, uh, the find out. Yeah. So do you honestly believe that 92% of kind of important uh, actors in these organizations believe that stakeholder, prim stakeholder capitalism is the right way to go? Because your results are pretty dark, right? And I think if I remember hearing what Bob said, he said that that didn't vary too much between the different populations. So is that something that we can rely on? Or is that something about, you know, often there's a survey bias that people give you the answer that they think you want to hear. So how, how rely, well, what do you honestly think the, the numbers are in terms of what fraction of the investment community, the activist community, the other communities actually truly believe in stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism? We, we discuss a lot uh, when we started this, <clears throat> this analysis, like about the other, sort of like a natural bias of the uh, survey respondents, mm -hmm. because the, uh, the most of the people we reached out to uh, are already, you know, the showing their interest positively or negatively on this like stakeholder capitalism or like, you know, sustainability issue. So uh, I wasn't very surprised to see this kind of like a very high percentage positive result for the stakeholder capitalism. But on the other hand, recently I, was personally involved in an event which actually gave me a little bit more confidence that this number actually may be representing uh, where the world is heading to, which is the, uh, you know, I serve on the mission committee of Danone, the French food of conglomerate. And, uh, you know, like uh, last June, they went to global shareholders base asking about the, uh, their idea of transforming their corporate structure to enterprise a mission, which is like a public benefit corporation, which stipulate their purpose of, you know, the uh, raison d'etat is not to just uh, to create the value for shareholders, but create a value for multi-stakeholders, including the environment. And uh, they went out to the global, global shareholders base to get their vote at the shareholders meeting. And a 99.9% 90, .9 of global shareholders of Danone supported the proposal from the, the executives to change, to, to transform the company to truly reflect the stakeholder capitalism. So uh, I think the, uh, we have to admit the, uh, the, all the statistics, the survey has uh, the other uh, uh, sampling buyers, but uh, I think we started seeing a lot of like a real world example uh, to actually the other uh, support. This is probably representing uh, where the other are, you know, the, uh, the community or like a business community is heading to. Why don't I kind of weave in some questions from the audience? Uh, right now, we're talking about definitionally what constitutes the different stakeholder groups, uh, stakeholder agendas. Two questions about diversity, one from Angela in the UK and the other from Jennifer in London. Doesn't diversity and inclusion already e include equality? And then from Jennifer, how do we solve the chronic inequality when the elite control most of the wealth and talk about inclusion and diversity at the same time? would like to, uh, the first one is definitional, doesn't diversity and inclusion include equality? And the other is, is there a, a 
some dissonance, some cognitive dissonance between um, the current elite control of wealth and yet same talk, time talking about inclusion and diversity. Anybody wanna try those from, from the audience? And then we'll get back to the, the actual survey. So, so let me, I'll start. I mean, I, I think that they are different diversity and inclusion and inequality. There's different forms of inequality. There's inequality in terms of race, gender, income. And I know that uh, all of these things matter to investors. I think income inequality is being seen as a system level risk in the same way climate change is. You see it in terms of political polarization, the breakdown of the multilateral world order. Um, the person who sort of pointed out is there, um, so it's kind of some issue here with the elites controlling wealth. I mean, look, I think it's a fair point. Um, you can look at executive compensation ratios to the median wage in a company. And it's interesting. I don't know how meaningful it is. What's clear is that wealth is being concentrated in a smaller and smaller number of people. And I just think that's deep stabilizing for the system. And I think the challenge that companies have and investors is that they know what to do about climate change, you know, pressure companies, stewardship engagement to reduce carbon emissions, invest in renewable energy. From an investor point of view, kind of what are the actions that you take with respect to, you know, inequality? I mean, you can you can push for, you know, more diversity in the board and the workforce. They're doing that. There's not a lot of data that's reported. Um, kind of how you deal with income inequality is even more complicated. And so, I think that's one of the reasons that they recognize that it's important, but I think they're kind of struggling to get their arms around it. Um, in terms of the first question, Peter, I'm not quite sure I understood that. So maybe they, you could repeat it or Allison, if you understood it or Hero. No, Bob, I think, I think you addressed it, which was doesn't diversity and inclusion include inequality? And I think it depends on where you are in the world, but in the US, I think those two questions are separate. They, they intersect, but they're separate. Good, and again, you know, folks out there, please send us lots more questions. But going back to the study itself, so the first part, you know, um, there may be some survey bias, but it says that aspirationally, you know, across many sectors, there's a desire for more stakeholder, um, more consideration of stakeholder interest. Got that. Um, the second part that in terms of the slide was, you know, among the issues, diversity and climate and, and uh, and COVID issues were all important in different levels. Uh, any surprises on that one? Or I guess you've already said there's some timing there. Maybe the third slide is the one that I'd like to go to. Maybe we can actually put it up. This is the slide that shows, and if you can explain exactly what we're looking at, this is the performance by uh, the different sectors on those different questions. So it's slide, it's number eight, I think, in the deck. Maybe we could just leave that up and you can First of all, just slow down and explain exactly what we're looking at. And a couple more. This one. So let me just slow down. So what did what are we seeing here? And let's make some sense of, of what this is saying. And if to the extent that you remember, if you slice this by various uh, kind of subgroups, um, whether there's any insights there. This so, was a, a, oh, Bob, go ahead. No, Allison, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, this was a survey question of the sort of perceived performance of these various sort of sector groups, right? So um, those who were given poor performance were scored four and five on a Likert scale. And then those who were given, uh, sorry, poor performance was one and two and mm -hmm. strong performance was four and five. So this is sort of what the GlobeScan survey found about the perception of performance from all of the global stakeholders that we surveyed. Um, and, you know, for, for COVID, I think having independent research academic organizations who are of course, you know, in, in the middle of uh, really developing vaccines, I don't think that's surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and then you see civil society on the inequality side being given the strongest performance on inequality, which is, mm -hmm. you know, I think probably overweight NGOs that have been um, working on inequality and diversity issues. Yeah. Uh, charitable foundations, that's I think are right in the middle because they're doing a little bit of everything, sort of depends on which charitable foundations you're looking at. If it's sort of the Gates Foundation, they're obviously had a meaningful role in um, bringing government stakeholders with private sector stakeholders together to solve some of the COVID challenges. Um, and then companies, 
uh, on COVID-19 are pretty far down the list. Companies and governments are pretty far <laughs> down the list um, on COVID-19 and, um, and similarly on inequality as well. And I think, I think that I think that makes sense. I think it's hard for um, survey respondents to think about the you know global corporate set as sort of meaningfully good actors on on these kinds of issues, and similar with national governments as well. Um, and then institutional investors were were last uh, for for both, but their their role is so much less visible than the other sort of actors in that left-hand column. I think um, they do so much behind the scenes and Hero can, can you know, talk about having an engagement strategy, but so much of that isn't public. There's very little transparency around what institutional investors are doing. So I think um, that's probably why their response was, was scored last. So just one quick thing I'll add, Peter. I'm in an age where I don't remember much of anything, let alone a lot of detailed data. And besides that, I wasn't a finance professor like you. So, but I do remember one thing, which is that when we let, when we broke it down by category and we look at institutional investors that like hit rock bottom by a lot, right? As you can see from this slide, um, their views were about the same. I mean, it wasn't like the institutional investors said, look, we're rocking it. We're doing a great job. And everybody else is like, you know, saying, no, you're not. Um, you know, they kind of had pretty much the similar view that the in institutional investor community wasn't um, doing such a great job on these issues. And I guess that was where I was going to go. Um, it, when you slice it by, you know, each actor themselves, did they seem self-aware? And Bob, what you're saying is the institutional investors on these two dimensions did seem self-aware. Were there any areas that you felt or that, that the data would suggest that uh, these various groups were not as self-aware as... Uh, as institutional investors? I, I don't recall that leaping out at me in, in any of these, even with the companies. And <laughs> Allison and Hero, you may, you may have better memory than I do on the details. Yeah. Nothing leaps out at me in my memory. Yeah, well, I actually, you know, the don't have, um, you know, the, uh, the memory of that kind of the detailed discussion on this. But the, uh, the one thing I just want to add is, you know, I think this is really reflecting the uh, the frustration inside of the institutional investors, uh, as some of the respondents are representing their sustainability effort. So uh, even within the institutional invest, institutional investors, like asset management company or asset owner, I mean, uh, there's the inside you know the in-house battle uh, between sustainability team and the portfolio managers and. Uh, Sustainability team is showing a lot of frustration, like they really don't think their peers or colleagues are doing enough on these like issues like COVID-19 or inequality. And uh, also this may represent the, uh, the, uh, the people outside of our industry or like investment, you know, the investment community are, are very frustrated that the investor is only pushing for the short-term profit and are not doing enough uh, to uh, accelerate the change uh, to address these issues. So uh, I actually wasn't very much surprised that the institutional investor appeared to be the, uh, the, the most you know, sort of laggard uh, in this survey, uh, getting very uh, negative, uh, you know, perceived, uh, you know, the um, uh, scores. And the other chart that's not here, and again, I'm not trying to make this a memory test, is that you do COVID-19 and inequality, you don't do climate. Do you recall what the results generally were around climate? So I'll pick that up. So the, the test of corporate purpose was really focused on COVID-19 and inequality. So those are the specific things we asked about and analyzed, and that's the regression equation that Allison talked about. What makes climate change interesting is there was more of a just kind of, you know, how would you prioritize? And it was kind of, you know, fairly strict, you know, kind of how would you would rank these things? And so we had a broader list of topics and that's where those kind of indicators came from that Allison also talked about. So while we weren't focused on climate change, you know, in the study, the, um, the empirical study, the regression analysis, in the survey, we asked people kind of what their priorities would be. So even though this was being presented as a study test of corporate purpose with the purpose being focused on two elements, mm -hmm. COVID-19 and inequality, when respondents were given the opportunity to rank issues in terms of priority, even in a survey focused on COVID-19 and inequality, 
climate change was mentioned as the number one. Great. So let's use, I mean, the title here we used provocatively was cheap talk. So if we can go to the next slide. Again, this went by pretty fast for some folks. Um, how do we interpret this? And you know, the negative coefficients of the insignificant coefficients on BRT signatory, Ruth on COVID-19, is this evidence of cheap talk or could it be something else? Or how do we make sense of this evidence? And what other evidence would you like to see to understand whether or not BRT signatories or other well, kinds of- It's probably been 40 years ago. since I've done a regression analysis. So I'm gonna let Allison start with that one. <laughs> I mean, this, this just means that simply by having a BRT signatory does not mean that you are outperforming your peers on COVID-19 or inequality performance <clears throat> from a market sentiment perspective, right? These are also sort of relative rankings um, or relative performance. And so I, I don't necessarily think it's, uh, you know, I can't, I don't think you can look at this regression analysis and say, this is all cheap talk. I think there's a lot of context here that the regression doesn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily capture. Uh, but uh, Bob, you look like you're grumbling. So why don't we get rid of the slides so we can see everybody Let's a little bit better and, and not talk to the slide, but kind of talk more generally. So if you yeah. wanted to understand the true progress that firms are making towards greater stakeholder uh, uh, approaches. How would we measure this? What would you look for? What evidence other than surveys might be useful? Well, look, there's been other studies that have done and Allison was right, I was grumbling. So, I mean, what the regression shows <laughs> is that they were, you know, performing a little bit better on inequality, a little bit worse on COVID-19, it wasn't dramatic. The fact that it's not dramatic, I think is indicative. I mean, the business roundtable has come out and said, look, it, we're gonna be, <laughs> having a purpose that's multi-stakeholder capitalism and you analyze them compared to everybody else. And, you know, they're not like distinctly worse, but they're not distinctly better. And there's been other studies that show the same thing. I mean, in MSCI, I did a study, two professors at the London School of Economics and Columbia Business School did a study specifically focused on the BRT and they found that they actually underperformed. Uh, the, the academic study found they had more labor and environmental violations. They paid more penalties. They were spending more on political lobbying, they had you know abnormal executive compensation. Now, in fairness, a group called Just Capital came out and said you know that they were doing a little bit better. So, it's not just this one study. In my view, I think there's a lot and <clears throat> sort of shows that the business roundtable isn't living up to its aspirations. Now, you can say maybe it's time, Peter. You and I have talked about it. I mean, I think every company's board of directors should publish a statement of purpose specifically for the company. Mm -hmm. I've been banging on this for years, and I thought when they came out with this statement on the purpose of a corporation, getting company boards to just write a little two-page specific purpose, the BRT said each company has its own purpose. <laughs> There's almost no examples, not a single one of the Business Roundtable Company's board of directors has published a specific statement of purpose. So signing a little declaration that lists five stakeholders and there's nothing <clears throat> being done by the company, no declaration from their board, no reporting on how they're accomplishing their purpose. I think it's cheap talk. So let's stick with companies for a moment. Um, and then we'll talk about maybe asset owners and, and then on the investment management side of the house as well. So in terms of, so Bob, if I'm, let me kind of parody your point a little bit. It's all about levels. It's not about changes. If you're going to score low, then, that's, that's all the evidence you need as opposed to the change view. And I know that you know our common friend, George Seraphim would argue, we gotta look at the changes as well as the levels. So improvement. So should we be looking at the levels of these activities for corporations? Should we be looking at changes? And then your specific to do action item then is a statement of purpose. Allison and Hero, at, for corporates, uh, how do you interpret you know, uh, success in, in these dimensions? And then what would be the kinds of actions that you'd call for at the corporate level? Sure. Uh, let me, um, can I start? Yeah, please, please. Well, I think the, uh, you know, uh, now it's all about actions. <laughs> the reason why is, as Peter, you uh, pointed, me out, pointed out earlier, like the 92% uh, of respondents are saying they uh, you know, support this multi-stakeholder capitalism model, right? Five years ago, this would have been different. And, uh, but now 
it became, whether they genuinely believe or not, it becomes became almost like a politically incorrect to say we only care about shareholders, right? So uh, that was kind of, we already achieved the first, you know, the, uh, the milestone, which is everybody have to say they care about the other, you know, the other stakeholders than shareholders. And the next is, you know, we have now we have to question about is it like uh, you know uh, multi stakeholder washing <laughs> or like uh, you know the uh, cheap talk or ESG washing green washing whatever the washing you know we hear a lot of beautiful words from the corporate leaders so when we are at the I was at the GPF the uh, you know the CIO role I tried to examine the difference between asset manager CEOs sets in public and uh, how their portfolio manager invest our money. So uh, we actually now have to focus on whether you know, the, they are taking action to support what the, the CEO are talking about. So uh, I think there's a lot of different action points we can, uh, we can uh, you know, the, uh, monitor, but the, uh, the, in each like, uh, ESG topic, uh, we think we should specify some like a benchmark or the, uh, the particular, you know, the, <clears throat> information to monitor to see whether they are really interpreting what they are saying into the actions or they are just uh, using that as a, like a you know like a, you know the multi stakeholder washing uh, so that they can look look nice so uh, but it's, we always observe a lot of discrepancy between what the ceo says and how the, yeah, the institutional reacts to that but maybe that's the case for any like a transformation of the business model so uh, we are really at the stage of we need to push them to really show us with the action. Uh, and there's a lot of actions they can take. Okay. Allison, you want to follow up? Sure. I think, um, so I'm going to speak to American companies because I think, I think global companies work a bit differently. But one, thing, one little factoid that I'll cite is there was a Fortune, um, a Fortune <laughs> magazine survey of Fortune 500 CEOs. And when, when they were asked about stakeholder capitalism, 64% basically said that this is what they'd been doing the entire time, right? Yeah. So it, it, this indicates that there's like a fundamental disconnect of what exactly stakeholder capitalism is. Um, and I also don't think that the US has the social norms and the cultural norms that sort of are aligned with a natural stakeholder capitalism model, mm -hmm. right? You know, in the BRT statement, it says, we'll, we'll pay our employees fairly. What does that mean? In the US, a CEO can very easily think that paying your employees fairly means paying them the minimum wage, which um, you know, is arguably not enough in many areas mm -hmm. in this country, right? So what, is that, what does that really mean? We also have, I think, um, a bit of a tyranny of meritocracy, which is we think people should have things when they have accomplished enough in life to have them, right? This idea that you should be able to be a grocery store clerk and still make a living wage and still be able to support your family isn't necessarily naturally aligned with a very sort of individualist success driven society. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, stakeholder capitalism is easier in Europe because the social risk, frankly, of not taking stakeholder considerations in, into account is too great. If you're in Germany and you don't meaningfully incorporate the feedback from your employees, that's not gonna work well for you, right? Um, and so you don't see companies in the US being comfortable with putting employees on their boards, which I think would be sort of a meaningful indicator that a company really does have a stakeholder uh, approach because frankly, employees are probably the most important stakeholder group without which the company does not exist, right? Um, and, and we just don't have that acknowledgement that maybe you have to fundamentally change how you think about a corporation. And I will say, not as a sort of get out of jail free card, but our legal system here is not set up to support stakeholder capitalism. You know, in American jurisprudence, uh, shareholders have rights, stakeholders do not have rights from a corporate law perspective. So um, I think when you're working within that framework, it's hard to meaningfully pivot to, uh, to a U European style model. So, Peter, if I just so I think Allison's right in what she said about you know America and kind of what the, the legal structure is like here. But 
No, to your question, is it kind of movement, improvement? Is it the absolute level? I mean, the, this was called a test of corporate purpose, and I don't have data. Allison may have data hero. But I got to tell you, you know, reading the papers, it seems to me like I saw a lot more people being laid off than I saw dividends being cut, you know, and that's a choice that companies can make. That was a test, right? They were tested, there was trade-offs, and they made the trade-offs in favor of keeping the dividends and laying off employees, putting it on the state, saying there's unemployment insurance, and there was no legal requirement that they have to do that. They could have made the other choice. They could have cut the dividends and kept the people. I'd written a piece uh, earlier in the year called Stakeholder Dividends, which is the idea that, you know, normally all dividends are defined with respect to shareholders. But if you look in the banking sector, for example, there would be a variety of things that you could do, use some of your dividend or what would have otherwise been dividends to, uh, you know, kind of for loan uh, forgiveness, for fee forgiveness, for kind of overdraft issues, uh, you know, so the, 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 even the language of stakeholder dividend is not one that's well-defined. Well, actually, there's a question from the audience which picks up on some of this. If, if business is all talk, do regulators or governments have a role to play and to hold them to account, uh, come and insist, them on, and insist on a statement of purpose or more? So, Allison, you talked about the potential defects in the legal system. Um, before we get to the kind of the financial pressure that could be put on by asset owners and in investment managers. What's the appropriate role for government here to uh, um, move us towards uh, this more stakeholder approach? Or is that an appropriate question that we've just had an election in the United States and you know, it's only one country out of many, but it's not an unimportant question. So what might an be- An election that hasn't been resolved. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. we <laughs> well, I was fraud. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I can comment on that. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm a special advisor to the Japanese government. And uh, this morning, I had opportunity to talk to the uh, policymakers. And uh, one of the uh, suggestion I gave was to Japan, you know, our uh, company law or corporate law doesn't allow the other uh, company to set up their corporate structure to legally address multi stakeholder interest. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike, uh, you know, the French or actually even in the U.S., 28, I think, states uh, has the, uh, the public benefit corporation structure uh, to choose. So although it's not being widely used, uh, and I recently asked the, uh, the people like Mark Benioff, Salesforce, who's the biggest advocate of the uh, stakeholder capitalism, why don't you transform your company from C corporate to a public benefit corporation? So uh, there's uh, some uh, options in some countries, but the, uh, if the, the government uh, really want to push this agenda and uh, if they think the, uh, the corporate is a big, uh, played a bigger role uh, in achieving more social like, issue or addressing social issue, they should work on legal structure on the corporate structure. Uh, that's my opinion. And the second is some of the uh, like ESG agenda, like the uh, climate, uh, they don't need to really uh, revise the, uh, the uh, company law or anything. They can actually put the, some regulatory framework for the corporate to competitively address the climate change. So that the, uh, the, there's a different way for the, uh, the uh, policymaker or the governments to really uh, direct the, uh, the you know, business community uh, into the sustainable direction. Great. Can I pick up on that? Because not every listener is going to know what a public benefit corporation is. So could somebody define a public benefit corporation and then say, if, if say, for example, Salesforce was one, what is the mechanism then to enforce their public benefit, the public benefit aspect of, of their kind of new charters? So first of all, quick definition for people who don't know it. And then, you know, what teeth does that have? How, how does that actually change anything other than more words on more paper? Yeah, so I'll let do the other. Let me just uh, quickly describe what the uh, the French uh, enterprise mission uh, does. I mean, uh, that's basically the same concept as a public benefit corporation, which I serve on the commission uh, mission committee. So, uh, enterprise mission, the French corporate law requires the uh, the company to set up the mission committee. Uh, side by side with the uh, the corporate board, mm -hmm. and uh, so the corporate board takes care of the uh, stakeholder uh, shareholders because they are representing shareholders. Uh, but the mission committee represent the multi-stakeholders' interest. So uh, there's like uh, you know the two kind of like a board, 
uh, you know, the, uh, the being responsible for the uh, different stakeholder interests. So uh, it's very interesting. We discuss about that kind of like, uh, you know, uh, how to react to the COVID-19 by reducing a workforce. What's the impact on that community at the, uh, the mission committee before they discuss that with the board? So uh, they actually come up with that kind of structure. I have less knowledge about the U.S. Benefit, Property Benefit Corporation, which probably Bob has better and has better knowledge to explain. Allison, do you want to take the definition? Sure, sure. The, the, the public benefit company in the U.S. is a separate kind of, of corporation that's an alternative to an S-corp or a C-corp, which is a sort of general incorporated uh, model. And it, it enshrines the rights of stakeholders uh, in the incorporation um, model. So like when I said sort of share, stakeholders don't have rights in the U.S., under a normal C-corp, uh, shareholders have rights. You can sue the company if they're not maximizing shareholder value. You can't sue it for stakeholder value. Under the public benefit model, you can sue uh, as a stakeholder um, if they are not meaningfully incorporating your interest. That hasn't been tested, by the way, but in theory, that could happen. Um, it allows corporations to, um, to, to meaningfully incorporate their stakeholder feedback and the stakeholder interests which is legally risky if you um, aren't, if you're set up as a C-Corp or an S-Corp. So Allison's got it exactly right. I mean, the way Leo Strine, so Leo Strine, for people to know him, was the former Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. So if anybody knows about corporate governance in America, it's Leo. And the way he describes it is that in a Delaware C-Corp or any C-Corp, directors may take account of other stakeholders if they can make an argument that it contributes to shareholder value over the long term, which is true, although the ideology is still kind of against that. Under a public benefit corporation, directors shall. So it's the difference between may and shall, you know, as Allison said. And um, I'm glad that Hero asked Mark Benhoff about this because there was this rumor about a California company that was going to become a public benefit corporation. And Hero, I was thinking it was Salesforce, but but it wasn't. It's a company called Viva Systems. But But we do have one US company um, that's moving in that direction. And um, I think, you know, to the beginning of your question, Peter, I mean, let's cut to the chase. I think, you know, a lot of this is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. If you think about our colleague, Colin Mayer, his book, Prosperity, you look at corporate form, you know, over centuries, this current construction we have is, you know, relatively limited, you know, time, 70, 100 years. I think what we need is a wholesale change not just the public benefit corporations become the option. <clears throat> I think it should be the requirement. So I would be in favor of, you know, federal legislation in the United States that says, you know, we're moving from, you know, the C Corp to a benefit corp. That's the kind of role the government can play. And I think unless the government does that at a wholesale level, you're not going to get the degree of change that you need fast enough waiting for companies to voluntarily adopt public benefit corporation status. I think, well, Bob, I think uh, that's very disruptive. <laughs> that's very disruptive to the American corporate system, which is kind of an engine of the global economy. I think what's going to happen, not what we want to happen, but what's going to happen is you're going to see more startups um, using a public benefit corp model and then IPOing, and then the market will decide whether or not there's a penalty to being a public benefit corp or not. We saw Lemonade IPO um, earlier this year. There wasn't sort of any discount associated with that, but that's how change is gonna happen. We've seen frankly from the entire sustainability corporate um, conversation that retrofitting existing organizations to be more sustainable is a Sisyphean struggle that we're still involved in, right? And so I think starting with uh, private companies that become public companies with this model is going to be how you see change happen rather than large companies retrofitting themselves. And then to follow up with you, Allison, if not for this corporate change, what other things would you recommend for kind of traditional you know, C-Corps um, that might push them a little bit further along in this journey? Well, I, I think it's a recognition of, of who your stakeholders are. And then, like I said, meaningfully incorporating them. I am a big fan of um, what gets measured gets managed. Okay. And so I do think that corporate disclosure on, on stakeholder issues is 
going to be one of the only indicators of whether or not a company is trying to sort of do the right thing on stakeholder engagement. Um, when you look at how little information we have on human capital management, again, employees, very important stakeholder group, very little disclosure externally on, on employee surveys and on employee engagement, on diversity and inclusion, on pay gap issues, very, very little disclosure. And so you're not going to know necessarily, and this is one of the challenges, frankly, for investors, you're not, you're going to see a very glossy sustainability report, it looks great, there's a professional narrative, it sounds nice, but you have to go to the data. Yep. How are employees experiencing this organization, um, which is, which is very different than the kind of data that we've seen before. So let's stick with that. So TCFD, for example, has recommendations around data disclosure, but should those disclosures be standardized, be individual by, should they be voluntary? Should they be mandatory? A number of us from Oxford are kind of calling on the uh, accounting standards board and in, in, you know, the global accounting standards board to, to make some of these more mandatory. What's your view there? Um, should there be more mandatory disclosure of a, a wider variety of non-financial metrics um, or is that not the way to go? I, so I personally <laughs> think I'm there should sure. be more, personally, personally, think there should be more, more and frankly standardized disclosures of, of human capital management. And I think, one, I think investors also want the same thing. Um, again, you can't sort of solve for diversity and inclusion and inequality if you don't have data. Um, and you're also seeing, I mean, the SEC that just up, updated Regulation SK, they said nothing about climate change for the most part, but they did say human capital management, you know, is a material driver mm -hmm. for a number of corporations. And so, and they also, you know, released their new diversity and inclusion report. So I do think you're see seeing key financial stakeholders saying that, oh, this is important, especially as you, you know, saw companies go through COVID-19 and there needs to be more disclosure on it. Yep. So you said you were very careful, Allison. You said standardized. So let me push it a little bit further because we know what we're talking about. We're talking about the Sustainability Standards Board. And we've talked Don't get about me fired, Bob. Well, do not get me fired. What, well, what do you want to know? This, this is your personal opinion. It's okay. Don't worry. You're not speaking for Morgan Stanley. I am. I'm speaking for Morgan Stanley. Mr. Gorman told me I could speak for Morgan Stanley today. Um, so standardized, but would you also say mandated? Just like we've got for financial disclosures, there's standards. And it's not voluntary, you have to do it. Would you agree with sustainability, standardized and mandated, or would you leave it to voluntary disclosure? I, no, I would, I, no, I would, I would mandate it. Every, every company over hundred employees in the United States has a one page EEO1 diversity disclosure. 4% of them, 4% of the Russell 1000 discloses it. Why? Everybody has it. We're not asking them to like learn how to do carbon accounting. Just release, it's one page, release it right? At least get everyone on the same playing field. Um, and I think, you know, frankly, by not, by not releasing it, it makes you wonder how companies are, are really doing on managing diversity. So, Allison, we finally found one thing. We finally found one thing after all these years we agree on, right? That we can agree on. <laughs> let me, I let think, me I mean, human capital management is, is material, I think, for every, you know, for pretty much every company, right? This is, this is, the, this is your core business. Whatever your business is, your core business is your employees. This is going to be the differentiator, frankly, of long-term performance as well. But so I'm let, get have, let me transition here. This is a good question that's going to move us away from the corporation over into the money side. The question is, what stops shareholders from pushing boards on these issues? Their investments will worth nothing if we don't solve the climate change issue. So let's, let's you know, we can... Governments can regulate, can require disclosure, can change board structure, but there's a lot of pressure in the, in the system that's represented by big pools of money, hero like what you have uh, kind, of, uh, kind of sat on top of and through investment management organizations, which Allison, you know, you're part of, and I, you're speaking privately here, I get it. Um, so what is it that the kind of the capital providers and, and asset owners of the world could do and, and what's gonna be the incentive for them to do more here? Sure. I, I think the, uh, you know, the asset owners, uh, you know, just to make an assumption, uh, the, uh, the you know, major asset owners tend to have longer uh, investment uh, time horizon or the money, the money for long term performance. Right. So uh, I think the, uh, you know, the reason why, you know, if you take the TCFD, uh, for example, 
the first, you know, the uh, requirement of TCFD recommendation is to uh, make sure you have a corporate governance mm -hmm. to monitor the, uh, the corporate executive to address climate change. The reason why they have that on the top of all the, the major agenda is the assumption is corporate executive, their tenure is too short to address all these like, uh, you know, the uh, uh, climate change and other long term issues. Right. So that they need the board to be responsible uh, for the CEO, not only pay their attention to make the, their bonus bigger but that they address the, you know, the long-term uh, issues like a climate change. So I think that the role that the investor should play is, investor probably even ha has even longer time horizon than the board and uh, make sure that the board address the other uh, shareholders long-term agenda. So uh, that's the, I think uh, the ideal, like a uh, sort of like a chain of, uh, you know, the, uh, the pressure or the governance. And uh, that's, Something I think the, uh, the asset owner should be more proactive because I never had the asset owner who talks about, we, to, who said they are short term investor or, you know, the 99.9% .9 of asset owner, they will say they are long term investor. They want to make a sustainable performance, right? So uh, they have to step up and uh, just uh, make that the um, statement that we wanted to make sure the corporate board or corporate governance to secure CEO to address those long-term issues, which probably affect their performance of the company beyond their tenure. Great. And Allison, as a sell-side equity strategist, what do you see to be the challenges of implementing a stakeholder perspective? From, from an investor's perspective, I think it's just um, figuring out who's doing this the best. Like I said, you know, the information you get is going to be usually in a sustainability report. Um, but you, you're not necessarily going to have full information about how investor or how corporates are, are taking the information they're getting from their stakeholders and meaningfully incorporating it into their business model, into their strategic plan, et cetera. It's still very, very opaque. And so, you know, a lot of the information you're going to get is in engaging with companies, right? And talking to management. And a lot of the information you get in those engagements isn't even what they say, it's what they either don't say or it's who's answering the questions, right? Can the CEO answer questions about sustainability and community engagement and you know, community needs assessments in a way that um, indicates that he is sort of, you know, he or she is meaningfully you know, hands-on in these issues and understands how they're incorporated in the business units and P&Ls. And a lot of that is still very much um, it's very much opaque and very much a black box. Great. Now, sadly, all these great questions have come in from the audience just as we're three minutes away from finishing. And they're really <laughs> good questions. Um, but I'm just going to use one of them and use that as the wrap up. You each have one minute. Taking a helicopter view, can each of you give one action or takeaway in a short sentence of what we can do to improve the current situation? So your parting thought about what to do and there's obviously this is a systemic issue. It requires lots of things. But if you were going to leave the audience with one thing for them to consider, um, what might that be? Um, and I'll do alphabetical here just to be Allison. I think B comes before <laughs> E and M. So we'll start with uh -oh. you and then Bob and then here. I would say, I, one, I think there's going to be a big sea change in how people invest. And I think the, the folks who are on the, on the um, webcast today are the ones who are going to drive it. So your own personal investment strategies, how are they moving towards sustainability um, and moving in the right direction for you know, mitigating climate change, mitigating inequality, et cetera. You have a lot more cho choices now for, as a retail investor in um, how you direct your investments. And so I would encourage everyone to sort of take a look at it and see, see what you can do there. Great, thank you, Allison. Bob, your quick, quick uh, one-liner. So one-liner, I want a simple two to three page um, stakeholder inclusive company specific statement of purpose by the board of directors that doesn't read like it could come from any company. What's unique about that company, how they make trade-offs and to follow up on it with integrated reporting to explain how they're accomplishing their purpose, where they're failing, what they plan to do to uh, kind of get back on target. Okay. It's not too much to ask. It's two pages. Give me a break. 
Hero. Yeah, well, I insisted that all the asset owners should make a statement like uh, they wanted the, uh, the company to run uh, with long-term perspective. And, uh, but the other thing I've been uh, encouraging is like, uh, you know, one of the stakeholders of stakeholder capitalism is employees. So whatever the side you work, uh, in the corporate side or in the, in, the, in the investor side, you know, just to raise your voice saying like, uh, you know, that we regard these issues are important and it should be, uh, you know, internally monitored and it should be externally disclosed. Great. Thank you all. So in wrapping up, I'm not going to try to summarize this. This is an incredibly important topic. You know, one of the questions I couldn't get to, you know, asked about how does this relate to Adam Smith? This is a topic that has been around for as long as there has been the corporation. It is, sorry for the pun, a heavy lift behind Bob's, you know, some weights that he's very proud that he's been able to lift. But this is a heavy lift. But whereas Bob lifts these, these weights alone, we're going to have to lift these together. One of the questions that I couldn't get to is how do we find collaboration around here? And another kind of question I couldn't get to, but I want to use this as the bridge to not only say thank you, but also to set the stage for this evening, is someone talked about not only stakeholders, but future holders which is you know, not just the people who are kind of around a table or even away from the table today, but aren't even born yet. And in that spirit, I'd like to not only thank everybody for speaking today, but join you all to join us again tonight at five o'clock uh, GMT, where we have a session called Youth Setting the Agenda, Agriculture and Food. And the point of this is to bring together the young voices um, who are in fact those future holders of society to talk about last week we did energy and this week we're doing agriculture and food. So Allison, Bob, Hero, thank you so much. Thank you for your, uh, your thoughts today. Thanks for leading this, this big uh, initiative that, you know, this test of corporate purpose, do lots more of it. You know, those of us in academia believe in evidence and evidence is what we need to continue to focus attention on, on the problems of the world. And you were all leaders and I salute you all. And I owe you all a dinner because someday we'll all be back together again and we'll be able to celebrate in the appropriate way. But for today, Absolutely. all I can simply offer is thank you and have a wonderful morning for Allison, evening for Hero, and pretty much morning for, for Bob, but he's probably been up for three or four hours anyway. So it's probably okay. midday for him anyway. Thanks to everybody. And thanks, thanks Peter. Good fun. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.